Starting to get nasty. We've got to get out of here. January 2003. A captain and his ship are in trouble on the Atlantic Ocean. The crew aboard the Finnish cargo ship Camilla struggles to get its 7,000 horsepower engine up and running. It's been breaking down all through the night. When the engine stopped working, I woke up instantly with the notion that something was wrong. The massive 12-cylinder engine has a badly damaged oil filter. So there's no oil to lubricate the engine's crankshaft. The crankshaft grinds against the bearings that connect it to the rotating pistons. That constant friction has caused the engine to seize up and die. Captain Marku Rakula knows that with no engine power, he and his 15 crew members are trapped. His 28-year-old third officer, Mayu Sari, loves the adventure of working on the high seas. But this is a new and frightening experience. When we realized that the engine couldn't be fixed, I remember thinking, this is an impossible situation. I thought to myself, now something is going to happen and there's nothing I can do about it. I felt numb at that moment. The Camilla is stranded more than 450 kilometers from the nearest port, St. John's. The Grand Banks off the east coast of Canada is the last place you want engine failure. The water here is shallow. A shallow seabed creates massive waves. The area is also known for its unpredictable weather. More than 7,000 ships have sunk in these waters over the centuries. And now, even worse news is rolling in. And tell him to double check with Esco. Mayu? Just a sec. Mm, doesn't look good. Coming straight for us. Mm. We've run out of time. A cyclone is approaching from the southwest. Winds will hit 150 kilometers an hour. Waves will reach 24 meters, enough to sink the stricken Camilla. The storm is still hours away, but Captain Rackola knows that help is also far away. Anyone who tries to rescue his crew will have to outrace the storm. Rackola is forced to consider all options for escape. The nearest tugboat is 20 hours away. But it's his best hope. We're going to have to try for a tug. Tugboat? Hmm. Out this far and this? Do you really think that... Of course. Even though I knew that our situation was uncertain, I could not show it. Or else everyone would start worrying, and that would lead to panic. Because the Camilla is unable to move forward, it has no resistance against the power of the storm. When the cyclone's waves hit this shallow floor, their energy gets compressed, creating huge braking waves. 
which can smash windows, shift cargo, and potentially even turn the ship upside down. The waves come in like this and beat and shake you. And there is nothing you can do about it. You're right here on top of us. One thing's for sure. We've got to get out of here. I'll call the owners. <clears throat> North 46, 55, 1. West 46, 49, 8. This is Mayu Sari's first job as an officer. During her six-year sailing career, she has never had to fear for her life, until now. When we realized that the storm would hit us if we didn't get out of its way, I had to switch into a certain mental mode in order to cope with the situation. Because even if something was going to happen to us, I couldn't start crying there or panicking. Started to get nasty. Waves are uh, six, maybe seven meters. If a tugboat's going to save them, it will have to outrace the storm. The engine won't be fixed for 24 hours, so we're looking for a tug. Yeah, okay. Okay, good, thanks. What'd they say? Uh, they're going to try to send us a tug. Great. Yeah. yeah. So how's it looking out there? It's a big low pressure system moving in from the east. It's going to be uh, poor visibility, high winds, waves are going to be very big. More than 600 kilometers from the stranded Camilla is home base for 103 Search and Rescue Squadron. Veteran helicopter pilot Major Gilbert Thibault arrives on duty. We are asked to go in situations that are extremes. And we have to make decisions also that may mean somebody's going to live or somebody's going to die. In the coming hours, Thibault will face many life and death decisions as he and his team put their lives on the line to save 16 sailors. The Camilla has now been stranded for two hours. The storm is moving closer. Okay, it yeah, will do. Right, thanks. There are no tugboats close enough to get to the Camilla before the storm hits. Captain Rackler will have to find another way to save the lives of his crew. We could not afford to take the risk of staying there in a storm of this magnitude, and then in the morning to have to check whether we were afloat or had drowned. He now faces the moment every skipper dreads. When I started to make a decision about abandoning the ship, it was certainly the toughest decision of my life and of my entire sailing career. Rescue Center Halifax to Camilla. Go ahead, Halifax. Please state your present coordinates. 46568 North, 46471 West. You got that? Finally, head kiku. There was a moment when I was quite terrified. 
It happened when the Coast Guard asked how many people our life rafts can take. Then I thought if we have to go on those rafts, in that weather, that will be really serious. But somehow I managed to wipe these thoughts from my mind and calm myself down. The ship is now rocking so uncontrollably that it's simply not possible to attempt escape in the lifeboats. We cannot stay here, but lifeboats are not an option. What we're going to do is send a helicopter to you. There's 16 of us! Your situation has been designated an M1 emergency. An M1 emergency. Top priority because the Camilla's crew is in danger of injury or death. Now we see. The hopes of rescue for Captain Rakala, 3rd Officer Sari, and the rest of the crew now hinge on a helicopter reaching them before the storm hits. But the nearest helicopter is in Gander, 618 kilometers away. St. John's is the closest point of land. The entire journey is more than a thousand kilometers. On top of that, the helicopter will have to hover for more than an hour to hoist the 16 sailors to safety. It's impossible without refueling. Standby crew report to operations immediately. Former and standby crew report to operations immediately. Okay, guys. We have got a cargo vessel out of Finland. They've lost their engine. She's almost 450 kilometer offshore from St. John's. This mission will push men and machine to the limit. Major Thibault's co-pilot is Captain Andrew Mercer. Mercer spent years flying tactical helicopters around the world. But on this six-man team, he's the new kid on the block. Obviously, we can't get there and back on a full tank. Hibernia, it's probably going to be our best bet. Major Thibault is counting on a fuel stop at the Hibernia oil drilling platform, located 150 kilometers from the Camilla. It will enable the helicopter to make the entire round trip. As far as time on scene, I know you guys would like as much as possible. Major Thibault has calculated exactly how much time they can spend on the rescue itself and still have enough fuel to get back to home base. By my calculation, I can give you 75 minutes. That's less than five minutes to hoist each of the 16 sailors. In, uh, 30 minutes. With each passing minute, weather conditions deteriorate as the storm moves closer to the stricken vessel. Before abandoning ship, the crew closes all doors and conduits in order to make the Camilla as watertight as possible. Third officer Mayusari notifies everyone of the decision to abandon ship. We're abandoning ship. Back at the base, Major Thibault is relying on this impressive piece of machinery to save the lives of the sailors, the newly acquired CH-149 Cormorant. He has stripped excess equipment from the helicopter to make room for 16 passengers. He must eliminate all unnecessary weight. The lighter the load, the more fuel they can carry. And Thibault knows that every drop will count on this mission. An helicopter is not like a car. You cannot run out of fuel and park it on the side of the road. I mean, running out of fuel is not an option. With 
With little to do but wait, Captain Rackala considers the consequences of his decision. Making a decision is sometimes a little difficult, but if you make right decisions, then anyone who knows about sailing will know that this guy is not dumb. He has been able to make the right decision at a critical moment. But if you make wrong decisions, after that your career may be gone as well. Sergeant Rob Vedito will be responsible for operating the rescue hoist. Before takeoff, he double checks to make sure that this lifeline is in perfect working order. Check. Right hand out is approved. Surface winds are 310, 15, gusting 20 knots. Secure takeoff from the south pad. The cyclone is closing in on the Camilla. For the rescuers, the race is on to get there first. I would like to you if the adrenaline's not pumping. The adrenaline is definitely pumping, and your mind is rushing and uh, going through all these different scenarios. How can I make it better? Where can I go for fuel? Do I need medical? It just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. You just keep going through the scenario, going through problems, coming up with answers, solutions. Um, it's just a constant. Your head's going all the time until it, it's done at the end. For Major Tebow, the Cormorant is the ultimate flying machine. Its three powerful turbine engines produce an incredible 6,400 horsepower. I often compare the Cormorant to a, an F1 uh, race car, a machine with that much technology in it, and uh, it's also a machine that you push to its limit. Uh, fairly often in the job we do. The cormorant-shaped rotor blades, protected by titanium strips along the edge, improve lift and increase speed. It also means this helicopter can operate successfully in extremely high winds. But even the cormorant has its limits. If they get caught in the approaching cyclone, Major Tebow will have to abort the mission. Rescue headquarters has warned Captain Rackala that it's not certain the helicopter can get to the Camilla. Of course, there was a sense of distress when we were told that the helicopter may not be able to come if the wind picks up. And there was naturally a sense of uncertainty on the ship about what was really going to happen. Will they be able to get us out of there, or will they not be able to get us out? Because the crew is in danger, the ship's owners have already contacted the families of everyone on board. One of the worst feelings was the fact that my parents and sister knew about my situation, but I couldn't contact them to tell them how it's going so far. It was really bad to think about how they must have felt when they didn't really know anything. Well, other than the fact that the ship was in distress, at sea, in a storm. I started reading a book to get my mind away from it, so that I would not panic. I sat around, took deep breaths, and calmed myself down not to do anything stupid, like get nervous or overreact. It did help me. It was like a meditation.
The pilot's plan to refuel at the Hibernia oil rig is shattered. They've just been informed that Hibernia can't supply them with fuel. Well, that's too bad for us. Okay, over. Go figure, huh? Hibernia out of fuel. We got information saying that the Hibernia had run out of fuel and being the biggest oil producer out there, it was kind of just ironic that they didn't have the fuel for us. Major Tebow was forced to divert to another oil rig to refuel. Make our way over to the Henry Goodrich. The cormorant heads for the Henry Goodrich drilling platform, an additional 35 kilometers away from the Camilla. The diversion will add 10 minutes to the journey. That means less time for the rescue itself. And now there's no hope of beating the storm. It's closing in at a rate of 85 kilometers an hour. The Henry Goodrich is a floating rig, not anchored to the seabed. So landing in high winds is extremely dangerous. Thibault will not be able to control the landing from his side of the helicopter. Never landed on a floating rig before. It's different. So to keep the helicopter in the, uh, in, into wind and to keep visual with the platform, I had to let Andrew fly. I, I didn't have the references on my side. Co-pilot Mercer has never landed on a floating platform before. It's a rare and difficult operation that requires enormous skill and nerves of steel, a critical moment to capture on video. One of the search and rescue technicians starts the camera rolling as co-pilot Mercer closes in on the rig. All yours, Andrew. I'll let them know we're coming in. Uh, rescue 911 to Goodrich. Seeking permission to land for refueling over. The cormorant has landed. But now the helicopter is in danger of being blown off the platform. In order to prevent this, Mercer has to reverse the angle of the rotor blade, a technique known as negative pitch. This creates a downward force and pushes the helicopter onto the landing pad. We actually sucked ourselves onto the oil rig. It's a really neat uh, um, thing that we can do. I don't think very many actually helicopters can do that. On the Camilla, Captain Rackala prepares to abandon ship. Yes, one can't help but wonder what my wife was thinking and whether we would ever see each other again in this world. When this thought came, I just had to push it to the back of my mind because I had to look after things at hand and then think about it again when the right time came. Appreciate the top up. Glad to be of help, Major. Best of luck out there. Thanks. We'll need it. After the stop on the oil platform, the cormorant has just enough fuel to get them to the Camilla, hover for 75 minutes to hoist the stranded crew to safety, and fly 477 kilometers to the nearest land at St. John's. But then, just before takeoff, the unthinkable happens. Okay, we're set. Com failure. We've got a com failure. Switching over to main system. Andrew, can you read me? Rob, can you hear me? The Cormorant's complex fiber optic communication system has stopped working. Rob, can you hear me? I'm not getting you. Okay. We're gonna do this by the book. We're gonna run a full system check. While Thibault and Mercer can talk to each other, they can't communicate with flight engineer Rob Vedito in the back. And they have to be able to talk to him to execute the hoisting operation. With Tom Breaker 3, AC bus. Can you read me now, Rob? Tom Breaker 2 on DC bus. Tom Breaker 3 on DC bus. Now the Major has a gut-wrenching decision to make. Press on or abort the mission altogether. This is not good. Tom Breaker 3, AC bus. Tom Breaker 
three, AC bus. Can you hear me now, Rob? Okay. Let's run everything twice. Com breaker three, DC bus. The first thing that came in our head was that we won't be able to do this, you know. Uh, if we cannot communicate, there's no way we're going to be able to recover these people. So uh, the first thing, I think, for all the crew members was, you know, we're stuck. We're going to have to go back. There's only an hour and 40 minutes until sunset, barely enough time to get to the Camilla and do a 75-minute hoisting operation. Thibault and Mercer systematically reset all the breakers on board. Rob, 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 anything? Can you hear me, Rob? Gotcha, Major. Loud and clear. Eventually, okay. success. We're back. Let's get moving here. The delay has cost another precious 15 minutes. When I left my cabin for the last time, I had those things we were allowed to take with us, a few papers and a passport. I had packed my suitcase, and I think I'd made my bed, just in case if the ship doesn't sink, somebody might come and see how I had lived there. Captain Rakala orders everyone to put on their survival suits. These dry suits are waterproof. They're made with neoprene, a synthetic rubber that contains millions of tiny air bubbles. The bubbles act as an insulator and help with buoyancy. Dry suits provide warmth by protecting the clothing beneath from wind and water. Without the suit, the bitterly cold water of the Atlantic would kill them. The last thing I wrote in the logbook on the command bridge was, of course, that most difficult fact that we are now going to abandon the ship. Captain Rakula is now certain the ship and its cargo are doomed. He relays the grim news to the ship's owners in Finland. You die of that? Yeah. Sure. Okay. me puettiin ne pelastatus puput sitten niinku. It was pretty difficult with that suit. He would hold the phone and I would push the buttons and he would talk. It was a strange feeling that this may be the last time they'd hear from us. Rekula here! ETA, five minutes on scene. Andrew, get the captain. As the cormorant closes in on the Camilla, the search and rescue technicians make final preparations. Rescue 911 to Camilla. Rescue 911 to Camilla. This is Camilla, go ahead, 911. Rescue helicopter approximately five minutes from you. All crew should gather on deck. Tell them everyone's down there, we're just on our way. We're on our way. Hang in there, over. Hey. We should go. One last smoke. After this trip, I quit. There's now just over an hour of daylight left. After flying for three and a half hours, Thibault and Mercer catch their first sight of the stranded ship. From a distance, the situation doesn't look life-threatening. But as they move in, it becomes obvious that this operation will test Thibault's helicopter and crew to the limit. Sunny rise, this huge 300-foot uh, piece of metal is out of control. 
very slowly. It's not spinning like a cork. It's, it's moving very slowly, rolling, twisting, corking, sliding up and down the waves. And you suddenly realize this is not a stable platform. We have to rescue 16 people. The storm is closing in. Scientists call this type of storm a meteorological bomb because it is intensifying at such an explosive rate. Within a few short hours, its winds have more than doubled in force from 35 to 75 kilometers per hour, with its highest waves reaching over 80 feet, the height of a seven-story building. My impression was that these guys were not going to make it through the night, and uh, we had to take them off. Otherwise, uh, that was the end for them. Major Thibault has a huge challenge. He has to figure out how to get as close as possible in order to lower his men onto the moving target. But if he flies too low, the cormorant could run into the mast of the tossing ship with deadly results. When the helicopter did arrive, I was naturally very excited that now we are finally getting out of here. This is going to be tough. I'm going to swing around for another look. The jubilation on board the Camilla doesn't last long. But all of a sudden, it circled the boat and then headed away from us. Well, that is when we all thought, hey, wait a minute, has the wind now gotten so bad that we won't be taken away from here? The sailors are certain the helicopter is abandoning them, their one and only hope of escape vanishing on the horizon. Major Thibault circles around to check out potential obstacles and determine his best plan of attack. He has precious few seconds to decide if a rescue is feasible. Thibault must keep the helicopter at a constant equal distance from the ship. To achieve this, he must make the helicopter rise and fall with the waves. Two search and rescue technicians will be lowered onto the deck. One man will control the guide cable to reduce swaying during the hoisting. The other, Corporal Scott Elliston, will hook each sailor to the hoist and ride back up to the helicopter with them, one at a time. Kind of thinking it's, uh, it's a big boat, it's moving, it's dead in the water, so it's going to be a, a different challenge. It's not. Uh facing straight into the seas where it's a more controlled situation that we're used to. It's rolling differently, which means as things move and we're on the hoist, there's a potential for us to be, you know, banged off part of the boat or, or hit or something. So you're kind of thinking of how you're going to do the business and, you know, sometimes what might go wrong. The success or failure of this mission will come down to split-second timing. That's where flight engineer Rob Vedito plays a crucial role. He has the best view of the deck. He must tell Thibaut when the search and rescue technician has landed safely and is ready to begin the hoist. As Vedito counts down, the rhythm of his voice signals how close the hoist is to its target. Five, four, three, two, one. Steady. Down. Rescue 911 to Camilla, over. Go on, 911! We need you to move your crew forward to the bow of the ship, over. Hey! It's pretty icy over here! We're going to get out of here. 
ryhmässä sieltä. We staggered to the front while the boat was going up and down, and the survival suits were quite slippery, so we had to walk carefully. I took the safest route to go across the deck. I held onto the railings all the time so that I would not slide back and forth. It was tough. The first rescuer is now on deck, controlling the guide cable. It's time for Corporal Scott Elliston to start his descent. You definitely feel vulnerable on the end of the cable, whether you're going to potentially get banged into something or if uh, the helicopter has a, a malfunction and uh, has to set down on the ground or whatever, if it, it's going to end up going down. Uh, you're on the end of the cable attached to the helicopter, so you're going to get dragged along with it. So you're definitely exposed when you're on the end of the hook. Timing here is crucial. Getting it wrong could mean serious injury for Elliston or one of the sailors. Okay, sir, raise your arm. When we get up there, I'll guide you in. Do not reach out at any time, okay? Here we go. I had some notion that the crew must have been a little bit scared, since no one had ever been hoisted by a wire into a roaring helicopter. And I can understand it well, since I myself felt some horror looking at that thin wire. How could it possibly carry two men? The cable may look flimsy. It is less than five millimeters in diameter. In fact, it can lift more than 800 kilos at a time. To maintain an equal distance between the ship and the helicopter, Thibault has to constantly increase and decrease power. Because the power is changing, adjustments are required to all the other controls. The helicopter is never stable. Keep in mind that that boat is uh, rocking like a chair, like uh, 45 degrees each way, and it's moving up and down. So you're following that boat through all that motion. And then, if you don't anticipate properly, the boat starts to rise up again. And, and now it's coming towards you, so you have to move the helicopter back up. One by one, the crew are lifted into the cormorant. There are still six sailors left on deck, and only enough fuel to hover for another 25 minutes. Right now, Major Thibault has another challenge. The power demand on the engines is constantly changing. To maintain the hovering position, the engines are working at 100% capacity. Now and then, strong crosswinds blow into the rotors, causing problems for Thibault. The crosswinds create something called translational lift. When that happens, the engine doesn't have to work nearly as hard. This constant change causes massive vibration and puts enormous physical strain on both the helicopter and Tebow. Well, it's very uh, tiring, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of uh, turbulence. We're moving a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a very demanding not only mentally, but physically. Do not reach out at any time, okay? Scott Elliston prepares the 11th sailor for liftoff. Five remain to be saved. Thibaut is keeping a close eye on his fuel gauge. He's running out of daylight and out of fuel. Soon there will be no choice but to leave the Camilla whether or not there are any sailors left on the ship. Even for a veteran like Thibaut, the pressure is huge. Saying that there's never any emotion would be uh, probably lying. There's always emotion. Let's put it this way. Uh, if, if one of our family member was in there, uh, it would probably be impossible to make a reasonable decision. So in many ways, uh, I believe not knowing the people you're, uh, you're helping is probably uh, what allows you to make uh, 
the right decision because it's always very difficult and you have to go step by step very slowly and very safely. We had to be calm. We couldn't show that we were scared or in panic because there's always that danger of fear being contagious. And now we had so little waiting time left that we needed to take it easy. Save a seat for me, Mayu! When it was my turn to go to the cable, I already knew what to do. I just tried to do what the guy told me. When we were going up, I remember wondering what's going on in this guy's head. We didn't really talk that much on the way up to the helicopter. But I wasn't scared at that time anymore, because it was obvious they knew what they were doing. Rob, now Scott, we have 10 minutes of fuel left. The helicopter has been hovering over the thrashing boat for more than an hour. The winds are increasing, the waves are getting bigger, and daylight is beginning to fade. Now you get the pressure on the radio, they're like, okay, where, where are you at? We gotta get going. So then it starts getting even more pressure, now you're rushing even more, because now you're down to the, the wire where you have to get it done. When I was in the helicopter, I looked through this rounded window and I tried to look one last time. And I did see it down there, floating. And it hurt to see it over there, rocking alone. It felt like, how did we dare to leave it there alone in the dark sea, with a storm coming? The rescued sailors don't realize that up in the cockpit, Thibaut and Mercer are now trying to deal with a new danger. It's killing us. Rotor, rotor, rotor. Okay. The additional weight of the sailors in the back, combined with the demand on the engine in hover mode, is causing decay or drooping on the rotors. They are actually slowing down. The last thing you want to hear is rotor. When you hear the word, the warning, rotor, 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 uh, you know that. It's, the helicopter's run out of power. And if you're losing power uh, and, and the speed of the rotor drops, you know where you're going. You're not flying anymore. But this time, when the dust was upon us, the storm was coming upon us, you're getting the last couple guys in. The slowing down of the rotors is critical. Thibaut can continue with the mission or abort. The fate of those remaining on the ship is in his hands. He has very little time to decide. Just going to have to ignore it. Thibaut takes a chance and ignores the warning. Captain Rakula and the two rescuers are still on the deck. Uh, you notice the winds were picking up. It was getting worse. The winds were stronger. The boat was rolling more. Uh, so it definitely became more of a challenge as the, as the mission went on. Captain Rakula has watched his entire crew of 15 ascend to safety. After more than an hour on the ship's icy bow, it's his turn. It was, to say the least, a little bit difficult to run to the hoist guy. You had to always watch whether the deck was like this or if it was like this. And when the deck was level, you had to run and be careful not to start running when the deck was tilting. The deck had to be level, and then you would go. When I was a young boy, I naturally was hoping that, if and when I went to sea, 
that I would never have to abandon ship. But that's what happened. And of all things, on a helicopter. My last look at Camilla was when I sat in the doorway of the helicopter, just before going in to sit down. I thought, this is where you'll be left rocking. It is a pity that we had to leave. But there was no choice. Thibault and his team complete the evacuation in 70 minutes. The Cormorant has just enough fuel to get to St. John's. As the helicopter picks up speed, the drooping rotors return to normal, but the storm is closing in. The sailors settle in for what they hope will be an uneventful journey. With daylight fading, the flight home will be in total darkness and bitter cold. Let's keep altitude at uh, 200 feet. May as well avoid these headwinds. We might even save some gas. You know, it wasn't that long ago we wouldn't even be flying in these conditions. The storm is closing in. Temperatures are dropping. Thibault and Mercer know that there's a real danger of ice building up on the rotors. The last thing you want on a helicopter. Helicopters are not designed to fly in ice. Um, when I was flying um, Army-type helicopters, you avoided it like the plague. You hit a, a cloud or answer ice and you did a 180, you returned back. Not anymore. The Cormorant is equipped with special de-icing equipment called a Rotor Ice Protection Unit, or RIPU for short. The RIPU system transfers heat into the rotors to prevent ice from building up. But there is a trade-off. De-icing draws a huge amount of power, power that has to come from somewhere. Ice is building rapidly on the rotors. The RIPU is sucking up power to get rid of it, and the cormorant is working to the max to keep its heavy load aloft. Something's got to give. The chopper is using so much power that Mercer's control panel, all the instruments he needs for navigation, dies. Using EIS screens. Prepare to take over. Yeah, standing by. Just give it a second. So now you're flying at night, low level over the ocean, uh, in uh, freezing rain and snow, and then to lose your instruments is, is quite something. I'm going to try switching my signal generators over to you. Here we go. Debo transfers the generators from his control panel over to Mercer's side of the helicopter. Essentially, I was using now his instruments or his signal generator to provide uh, input into my screens. Oh. Oh. It's one way to get the adrenaline pump in, huh? It seems to be over. The Cormorant heads for St. John's, 477 kilometers away. The passengers have no idea what their pilots have been dealing with in the cockpit. We never knew a thing about that. We couldn't even hear any sign that the helicopter might have had any kind of trouble. And I have the feeling that had we known, we would surely have thought, OK, we're going from the frying pan into the fire. Thirteen hours after the Camilla's engine died, the cormorant finally touches down in St. John's. It's been the longest day of Captain Rackala's life. It felt wonderful when the helicopter finally landed at the airport and we were able to walk on dry land, so to speak, without getting our feet wet. It was a really fantastic feeling. For Major Tebow and 103 Search and Rescue Squadron, it's all souls saved, mission accomplished.